Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the launch of a new photography exhibition entitled Indoors Experiences of Older People During Lockdown. My name is Nina Hallowell, and I'm a researcher in the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities at the University of Oxford. And I'm going to be your host for today's launch event, in which you will hear from the exhibition curators and one of the pe people who was photographed and interviewed for the project. First, we need to do some housekeeping. This event will run for 45 minutes. It is being coordinated behind the scenes by our event organisers. So we have muted you, the audience, and your cameras are all turned off. In the final 10 minutes, we will invite you to ask our speakers any questions you may have about the exhibition or to let us know your thoughts about the project. You can do this by typing into the Q and A, which is the speech bubble icon on your screen. I've been told it may either be at the top or the bottom, and I will read out and direct your question to the appropriate person. Please note that only our event organisers will see the questions typed into the Q&A. The rest of the audience will not see them until they are selected for discussion. Just to bear in mind that if you write a question, that this event is being recorded. So that's the rules of engagement finished with. Now a nod to our sponsors. Today's exhibition is being launched as part of the Being Human Festival 2020. This festival is the UK's only national festival of the humanities and is taking place from today until the 22nd of November. It is led by the School of Advanced Study in the University of London in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. For further information, please go to the website beinghumanfestival.org. That is beinghumanfestival, which is all one word, Dot org. Now on to the main event. I would like to introduce our first speaker, the photographer Adam Isfendia. Adam is a documentary photographer who's based in London and his photographs of people living in lockdown during spring 2020 are the basis of our exhibition. Over to you, Adam. Thank you, Nina. Um, first, I'd like to thank everyone who's worked on this exhibition for their hard work and enthusiasm. Um, I've really enjoyed seeing the work that you guys have done and the process in which it's all come together. Uh, I started this project back in April. It began when I was out walking and passed by a house across the road from where I live in East London. In the window of a house was sitting an elderly man watching the world go by and he acknowledged me with a smile. I smiled back and walked on but really felt an urge to take a photo of him. And I love taking street portraits. It's something that I haven't been able to or hadn't been able to do for a while at the time. Um, so a few days later, the idea of putting up a post on the Tower Hamlets mutual aid group um, on Facebook, asking if anyone would be interested in having their photo taken in front of their house came to me. So I put up the post on the second or third Sunday in lockdown, not really expecting many responses, um, but almost immediately was bombarded with messages. It built from there and took up most of my lockdown and it was like a full time job. I was managing around four to five shoots a day and covered Tower Hamlets and parts of Hackney. Um, and most of the photos and stories have now been compiled into a book. As an artist, one of the benefits of being in lockdown was the opportunity to work on a personal project without having to worry about finding work or making money as there really weren't many options. So I could dedicate all of my time and energy into it and and I love the fact that it's led into projects such as this one with the guys at the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities at Oxford University. Um, the lockdown's often been compared with the Second World War and May the 8th this year was the 75th anniversary of VE Day. So to commemorate the day, I found six people who have lived through both experiences and I went to their homes and took photos and interviewed them about their experiences during both wartime and lockdown. So around this time, I also connected with Federica on the Tower Hamlets Mutual Aid WhatsApp group. And she told me about the work that the Wellcome Centre of Ethics and Humanities at Oxford University are doing. And we talked about my project and how it would be able to fit in with their work um, with the end of the, it being shown at the Being Human Festival. Um, it wasn't my intention to focus on older people and the issues that they face in this current situation, but through engaging in this project, and some of the conversations I've had over the past few weeks with participants, 
It's become clear to me that lockdown is starting to take its toll on everyone, but especially the older people in the community, many of, many of whom are unable to go out and connect with friends or family members in the way that they used to. So thank you for the opportunity to work with you guys and to everyone who's joined to watch the launch. Um, I'll now pass over to Peggy, who is one of the participants in the project. So Peggy was born and raised in the East End and currently lives in Bethnal Green. She's 96 and we first met when I was doing the VE Day special as part of the lockdown project. I spoke with her last week about her lockdown experience and here is a video of the interview. So thank you. Um, how did you feel when the first lockdown started? How did I feel? Yeah, when the first lockdown started. Um, I don't remember really. I was very concerned, but um, not knowing too much about it. Um, I suppose like everybody else, get on with it and do your best and uh, hope it isn't for long, I suppose. And what's been difficult for you? Um, the difficulties uh, that I haven't, I feel so lonely. I feel so, I've got to make myself do things. Whereas if I have family here, or even when friends come <coughs> or did come, uh, it could be fun. Uh, but knowing that nobody's coming in, nobody is going to um, say, well, come on, let's go out, let's visit here, let's go to Greece, let's go to where you, you've lived for a while and you know you love Greece. I can't do that even now because I'm getting older and I think well, it's not helping. So I'm not really, um, forget what you asked me. <laughs> what was difficult? That's, that's difficulty that's fun, being yeah. alone and having nobody to just put their arm around me and say, you know, it's going to be fine. You've got to tell yourself, you've got to be pretty strong to get through this on your own, I think. What has helped you? Um, food, I think. <laughs> food, um, radio, uh, some reading I did at the beginning. Um, nothing different, really reading, uh, changing my diet. Uh, I've started rescue, doing cat rescue, that helped me, but really not a lot of difference and not, uh, I can't say much has helped me because I'm, I'm sort of strong in my, I don't sort of weep and say, what can I do? What's happening? I'm all alone. No, it's none of that. I'm, I'm, I'm proud that I'm the age I am, and I'm sort of pretty well. And what are your thoughts on the lockdown starting tomorrow? What are my thoughts? On the second lockdown starting um, tomorrow. I sort of got fed up. I thought, well, not again. We shouldn't have this. It should have been handled. And uh, but then who am I to say who who's in charge? Um, the scientists, the people who are all working on um, some virus um, that, that really they know li very little about. Hopefully now I think that things are moving and um, but is that what they're telling us? But, um, it, it will, I don't, I don't know if it will ever go, I don't know if it will ever be there like the flu. You have the flu, you have a flu jab, the next yeah, you have another flu jab, but you don't seem to get the flu. Well, is this going to be similar to that? Okay, and what do you think people can do to help older and vulnerable people during this time? Well, just be aware that they need, they need people. People need people. And um, I think people should um, make sure that if they see someone who is having difficulty, either mentally or physically or shopping or whatever, even if you go up to them and say, well, is there anything I can do? Do you need some help? Or just chat if you, if it, that embarrasses you, 
just go up and which I have done um, there's a park Betham Green near the station and there are a couple of old people sit there and at the beginning when I was allowed out sort of between the two viruses I was walking there and um, this, especially one particular man was quite sort of sad and I just started talking to him and he smiled and he said thanks love he said thanks and I thought that was wonderful that's what people should do talk to people and uh, if you feel they need you you be there for them Thank you, Adam. Thank you for that introduction and for showing us some of your very striking images. And thanks also to Peggy for her moving contribution to this launch event. I'm sure you'll all agree it is wonderful to hear Peggy's reflections on the first lockdown and her thoughts about the second and her advice to us all to treat each other well. Much has been said about older communities throughout the pandemic. And I think it is really important to hear about their experiences. Indeed, I think I speak for everyone when I say that your photographs and the accompanying stories manage to convey these experiences very powerfully, Adam. So thank you. The layout of the exhibition is split into four key themes with accompanying photos for each. The themes are isolation, connectedness, coping and memories. We're now going to hear from four researchers from the University of Oxford who developed and co-wrote the text panels for these themes and these reflect aspects of their own research work. First I'm going to turn to Associate Professor Mikey Dunn who is a bioethicist from the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities and the Ethox Centre. Mikey can you tell us a little bit more about the theme of isolation? I certainly can, Nina. Thank you very much for that introduction and good afternoon, everybody um, on the call. Um, so lockdown, I think, has imposed profound and unexpected changes in our lives, stopping us in our tracks in various kinds of ways. And the basic reality of lockdown, I think, can be a disconcerting and troubling experience for us all. Uh, as the American novelist F. Scott, Scott Fitzgerald famously put it in The Great Gatsby, the loneliest moment in someone's life is when they're watching their whole world fall apart and all they can do is stare blankly. And lockdown during a pandemic is also, by definition, I think, a time of forced physical and social isolation. And when we think about people being isolated, we typically think about isolation geographically. People being disconnected or cut off from other people across different locations, from our friends, from our families, and from the world around us. And when we think about the reason why we should be concerned about physical and social isolation, we tend to identify the negative outcomes that isolation gives rise to. For example, worse physical and mental health and the heightened feelings of loneliness, unhappiness, or just being fed up that Peggy described. And this can be particularly notable, I think, amongst older people who are frequently, though not necessarily, more disconnected from their communities in normal times. And older people might also be under instruction to shield themselves in their homes entirely due to their advancing age and pre-existing health conditions. But as I've argued in some of my research, there's also another sense in which we can understand social, social isolation that is ethically important. Instead of thinking about isolation just in terms of being apart from other people, we can also understand it, I think, in terms of being prevented from doing. But this means that when older people are isolated, they're unable to exercise meaningful opportunities to live their lives in ways that we can all recognise as being valuable and worthy of protection. And understood like this, isolation is an ethical problem that societies need to address because of the ways in which it fundamentally limits the scope of activities that older adults are able to pursue and choose between. In my view, supporting isolated elder adults during a pandemic is a social project, a project that we're all invested in, especially during the periods of lockdown. And members of local communities will need to respond in innovative ways to engage older people in social activities through their everyday interactions in their communities as neighbours, 
as volunteers and even as strangers just passing on the street. This is, I think, the route out of isolation and the path towards a good life for the oldest members of our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mikey. And um, now over to Dr. Federica Lucivero, who is also a bioethicist from the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities and the Ethox Centre. And Federica, would you now like to walk us through the theme of connectedness, which clearly it follows on very nicely from, from Mikey's um, idea that we need to do things together and develop social projects. Of course, Nina, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, well, during this pandemic, we heard a lot about social distancing and some of us uh, have also discovered that uh, physical distancing uh, is not the same of social disconnection as we sometimes find ourselves uh, continuously connected with friends, uh, families and strangers uh, through social media and video calls. But does it mean that we are connected? So what we try, what we've tried to do with the theme, uh, this uh, connect connectedness uh, theme, is to explore the boundaries of this space between uh, physical distance on the one end and social and emotional connection for all the people on the other. So um, the lockdown and the pandemic mean that older people experience new ways of connecting with their families, friends, and communities. So first and foremost, has been, uh, as it has been um, mentioned before, uh, people had to give up with gathering with their friends uh, in clubs or community centers or places of worship. Um, and this has been really hard for them. Um, but in some cases, they've also had been reached out more by people in their communities that have been trying to support the most vulnerable ones providing meals, for example, for example, or providing some uh, support, trying to talk to them more, to, to go at least uh, visit them from a distance. Um, but uh, lockdown has also had some impact on relationship, uh, relationships that people had with their families. Um, for example, some of the um, uh, stories told by Adam uh, to talk about how, I mean, people talk about how they've been told what to do and not to do uh, by their own children or grandchildren that were very um, uh, scared and worried about their well-being and, and were uh, giving them very strong instructions on how to act. So basically, these are all examples of different experiences of uh, social connectedness uh, during lockdown. And in this context, uh, where social relationships uh, adapted to the new situations, uh, we see, for example, how digital technologies have played an interesting role. And um, it's interesting because we often think of older people as being on the wrong end of the spectrum of digital literacy. Uh, however, we have seen an incredible resourcefulness in the stories collected by Adam. And many people who were worried, um, we have seen this first of all from the side of the families, and many people who were worried about the older members uh, of their families felt that they needed to give them uh, some devices to teach and teach them how to use them. Um, and this was interesting in first place because it was um, an attempt to, uh, you know, to, to create a, some new interactions within the same family. But then what we have also seen is that uh, many older people have been using these digital technologies, especially video calling platforms like Zooms or Skype or FaceTimes to stay connected to their families. Um, so grandparents have started reading bedtime stories to their children, uh, to their grandchildren. Um, and they've started watching Netflix series uh, recommended by their grandchildren. So this helps help uh, this have helped maintaining a sense of continuity and involvement in family life uh, across physical distances. At the same time, of course, digital technologies are not a panacea, and we cannot deny that older people have also often experienced firsthand uh, the limit uh, of virtual connections. Not only uh, the ones due to physical impairments, due, for example, to sight or hearing problems, but also more emotional limits, uh, like the sadness of not being able to hug their grandchildren uh, waving across the screen, 
or the impossibility to reproduce the joy that um, a bingo session in a community center or a dinner with friends can offer to a person. So this is something that um, it is important to keep in mind, this, uh, these different aspects of, um, of, of connection, of social emotional connection in a, con in a, in a context, context of a physical distance that uh, we want um, uh, our audience to, to keep in mind when watching the exhibition. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Federica, that is marvellous. And actually, it gives us a good link onto our next theme, which is the theme of coping. Our next speaker is Mira Schneiders, a researcher at the Mahidol Oxford Tropical Medicine Research Unit, commonly known as MORU. And Mira will reflect on the theme of coping. Thank you, Mira. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Nina, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about coping and many older people have spent a lot of time during this pandemic thinking about how best to cope with the lockdown. And for many, naturally, um, this involved thinking about how to stay safe. But as we've seen in the last two panels, many people have also cared about um, connecting and not getting lonely and isolated. And I just want to reflect on that point a little further. Because during this pandemic, the need to keep safe on the one hand and the need to feel connected um, have often been in stark contrast with one another. This means that during the lockdown, older people especially have faced many really difficult dilemmas when trying to decide uh, how to best keep safe, but also to make the most of their lives. And as part of research um, on COVID that I've recently been involved in to better understand the impact of the lockdown on people living in the UK, um, we also spoke to some older people. And what really struck me there, as well as in the stories that Adam has collected, is this real sense of dilemma and tension that many people have, many older people have experienced. So, for example, one older woman in her 80s um, who I spoke to who, who lives alone and was also alone during the lockdown told me that she didn't know how much time she had left to live. And because of that, it was very important to her to spend as much time as possible with her family and seeing them in the flesh. Um, so she really felt a sense of being heartbroken at not being able to see, um, for instance, her grandchildren growing up during the lockdown, as I'm sure maybe some audience members can also relate to. So while everyone has obviously been experiencing the sense of missing out um, during the lockdown of what we feel is important in our lives, I think it's really important to keep in mind the different life stages in which we find ourselves. And older people especially have had to cope um, with this heightened sense of sadness and grief about the things that they've been missing out on during this lockdown, such as long planned holidays or family reunions and celebrations. So I think that older people are having to make particularly difficult trade-offs between keeping safe um, and also finding ways to connect and cope during this pandemic. So my final point is about diversity among older people. Older people are too often stereotyped into being high risk, vulnerable and frail, or even dependent and burdensome. But actually one of the hallmarks of older age is um, diversity. And again, in my research and in the stories collected by Adam, um, we've seen older people who, who really want to contribute to their communities. Um, they feel very healthy and actually oppose the stereotype of being a high risk group. Um, instead, they might wish to be allowed to do more to support their communities doing voluntary work um, and helping out in their families. And we know that being able to support others is a really important way of coping ourselves in times of adversity. So in this way, um, older people's perceptions about their risks might sometimes be in stark contrast to those of public health messaging. So I think it's really important to go beyond the stereotypes that all older people are vulnerable and at high risk, 
but instead to see them as agents in their own lives and communities and to try to better understand what they have reason to value so that they can find ways of striking a better balance between keeping safe and also continuing to live a life that has meaning and value to them during this pandemic. And back to you, Nina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mira. Um, and finally, I'm going to hand over to our last speaker, Dr. Rod Bailey. Rod is a historian who is a member of the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities. His research focuses on the histories of epidemic disease and public health. So Rod, I think of all of us, you are best placed to talk about the theme memories. Thank you, uh, Nina. So from the point of view of a historian, so from my point of my perspective, I think the memories and the reflections on the past that Adam's collected provoke some really unique as well as important perspectives on, on COVID-19 and also the challenges that it's creating for so many people. They remind us, for example, in particular, really, that for some Londoners, aspects of this experience are not, are not new. This isn't the first time that they've experienced isolation and an extreme danger. Um, 80 years ago being, the, being perhaps the best example of this when the country was at war, when families were split up, there were food, clothing shortages, travel was restricted, rationing was in place, not to mention the ever present risk of death or injury from the air, we should remember, enemy bombing, V1 rockets, V2s and an accompanying concern for long periods of time for the well-being of, of loved ones. Also, it was very much, this was very much a time of national emergency, a sense of national crisis. So I think the testimonies of the people that Adams photographed remind us that it's not the first time that some have experienced aspects of what we're, what's confronting us today. But at the same time, I think they encourage us to think about the differences between then and now between the challenges we face today and those that were faced 80, 85 years ago. For instance, we might wish to ask ourselves, is it accurate or is it even helpful to think of a virus, um, a pathogen as, as an enemy, some kind of vengeful force with, with agency? And, and also what's really putting us at risk and threatening us, threatening our, our lives? Is it the virus or the other reasons closer to home or other global forces in place that accelerate the risks that we're confronted with and, and heighten them for us? And of course, should we also be doing more to keep each other safe and working to reduce the risks that we face today? And also, I think we might want to consider and reflect upon what are the priorities of those who are telling us these days to do as we're told and to bathe ourselves and to and to follow to follow uh, official guidelines. And finally, I think Adam's images and interviews help us reflect on the different experiences and perspectives of different generations. So how some of the risks and how some of the responsibilities confronting us today are viewed differently by different age groups. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Rod, and thank you to all of our speakers for really opening up this exhibition. Now, before I go, I open up uh, for questions from you, our audience. The organising team will now share the link with you to our online exhibition, which went live earlier today. So now it is over to you. We are particularly interested in your questions for our speakers and your thoughts in general on the project. If you'd rather not ask a question or make a comment here today, please consider completing the audience evaluation survey when you have time. And this is linked to our online exhibition main page. Now, I see we have actually got some questions in the chat for our speakers. And this first one is actually for you, Adam. Um, did you ever feel the, did you ever feel you needed to give help to any of the people you met or were photographing and interviewing? Or did anyone actually ask you for help in any way? Adam, you need to unmute yourself. 
<laughs> Sorry. Get there eventually. Um, so thank you for the question, Karen. Um, I've obviously, you know, I, I've felt when I've spoken to certain people, so, some I've stayed in contact with since and been speaking to over the last few weeks as well. Um, I've wanted to help. Um, I found that I think just by chatting to them, that has been a help, um, I think anyway. Um, and um, I, I haven't, I mean, no, nobody's asked me for help. I found everyone seems to have a bit of a support network. And also, I think a lot of them are of a kind of, of a generation where they don't really you know they they're quite strong a lot of them and and they no no one's really like Peggy said you know she she's not the kind of person who sort of catastrophizes I I, I don't feel like anyone um, who I who is in the project is ha, has you know has they they've both they've mostly just been a bit fed up and kind of wanted to get out and wanted to resume their normal lives and go back to you know the club or to meet their friends um and to be less lonely so no i think that the best i've done really is is stay in contact with some of them and talk to some of them joe um i joe's actually a family friend of mine and when i went round there i took an old photo of um him with my grandparents and i printed up a copy of that for him and sent it over um but other than that, no, not not really. I mean, I've, yeah, making phone calls and, and, and chatting, I think, is the main way I've been able to help. Um, and I've taken some food around to Peggy's as well uh, when I've gone around there. So kind of yes and no. OK, I mean, I think that leads very nicely into the next question that I have for Mikey, actually, because actually what you say you've been doing is definitely about support. So. I have a question here for Mikey, which says, what specific practical steps might people take to better support older people in their neighbourhoods, to build communities, help them to cope or to manage their isolation? Thank you, Nina. Um, I think for me, the answer to that question is probably the little things that we would otherwise take for granted. So. I think it's particularly difficult during a lockdown because we you know there's a we're all finding it difficult in managing our own lives in, in in various kinds of ways. And it's a tendency, I think, for people to look inwards and sort out their own problems and think about their family and and and, and to lose a sense of the world outside of their homes um, in that kind of context. Um, but I mean, my my point would really be, you know, we can all help out in various kinds of ways. There are formal and informal strategies we could adopt. So. You know, we, there is an opportunity, I think, generally at the time of, of lockdown to deal with the negative sides by emphasising the positive opportunities, including, I think, strengthening our community connections. So, yes, that might involve formal institutions like churches. It might involve community schemes like Neighbourhood Watch or ways of, of thinking about the neighbours who live amongst us. Perhaps we don't see very often in, in their own homes, knocking on someone's door, standing on the doorstep and having a conversation with that person. Or as um, as what Sarah was saying in the video, maybe just saying a few words when you're crossing the street with next to an older person, or perhaps saying something in a supermarket when you're passing each other by. I don't think it needs to be too demanding or too onerous on people. I think it's really for me about those little things, looking outside of oneself and one's own home as as we go about our daily lives in the community. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, the next one that's come in now is, I think, probably, um, oh, it's definitely actually uh, aimed at Mira. So uh, it goes, you describe the tension between keeping safe and making the most of life. So now based on your research and the stories collected by Adam, which feature in the exhibition, how would you say that older people have been coping with this tension, the keeping safe and the making most of life tension, which is a kind of tight, difficult tightrope to walk, I think, possibly some people might think. Yes, thank you for that question, Nina. This time I've unmuted myself, I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that, 
you know, I think it's really important, um, again, not to stereotype different people will have very different ways of coping. But some of the things that I've seen in my research is is really that, um, you know, the sense of staying safe, which we can probably all relate to in this pandemic, is a really important um, for for feeling well and for coping. So having a sense that that we have some control over who we meet or you know how much exposure we 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 put ourselves under in terms of uh, potentially getting uh, sick. And so I think that's that's almost like a, a baseline way that um, I think a lot of older people think about coping. But then as we've seen, obviously um, staying connected and also coping socially in terms of our social and emotional well-being is, is a really also a really important part of coping that has come out um, in our research. And, and there are little things such as sticking to a daily routine um, or you know making sure we, we get outside, um, having a project or some sort of creative endeavor that, that we can help to take our mind off of the heavier um, thoughts of the pandemic. Um, but also um, asking for for help or or giving help. I think I mentioned that earlier. I think it's really important not to assume that older people only ask for help, but they they might also. And something I've seen in my research 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 certainly is that older people um, have really benefited from being able to help out in their communities or in their families. Uh, grandparents reading bedtime stories over Zoom or Skype to their grandchildren. Um, things like this, I think, are, are really important for coping. And finally, um, one thing that has come out in our research is this uh, balance between staying informed, but also limiting overexposure to the news. So also finding times to disconnect um, from the news and, and have a bit of peace of mind. So. I think those are some of the ways that that people have shared that they've been coping in this difficult time. Thank you, Mira. That's actually very encouraging for me because I have recently stopped listening to the news and I thought maybe this was me putting my head in the sand and now I feel kind of vindicated that I I don't watch the news anymore, but I, I totally, I can totally sort of like empathize with some of those things, particularly the keeping routines, I think of, uh, I found very helpful too. Um, we have a history question that's come in now, or I'm interpreting it as a history question. Um, it definitely is. Um, so this is one for you, Rod. Um, in what ways does the past help us to understand or cope with the present? And if you think, it, uh, and if it does, do you think this is actually a helpful way of, of dealing with life? Thanks, Nina. Um, yeah, the past is a tricky one if you're trying to learn lessons. We hear a lot about that today, about the le learning the lessons of past epidemics, past pandemics, past outbreaks of infectious disease. How does society respond? How should it respond? Um, it's always useful and helpful when you peer into the past to, rem to remember that the context is very different, invariably, that these are different times and different places, and that lessons um, that may seem to be obvious and easily learned and not actually that applicable to to the situations that we're that we're that we find ourselves in in today but certainly there are um certain things certain aspects of past epidemics the seriousness of um uh, of some of them which we've been confronted in the past the importance of preparations uh, the importance of winning trust amongst populations and communities um these are resounding um experiences, really formative experiences um, in, in a great many previous pandemics and epidemics that um, we've been able to, uh, that we might, that we might be, it might be sensible for us to, to heed and pay attention to. Thanks Nina, I'll, we haven't got long so I'll move on. Let yeah. you move on. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm going to give every one of you the opportunity to quickly respond to a, a very good question that's just come in, which is, given that England has now gone into a second national lockdown, if there's one message you hope that the viewers of this exhibition take away, what is it? 
I'm going to ask Adam to have a go at this one first and then all of the speakers in the order in which they spoke originally to give me a one sentence take home message. Thank you, Adam. Take it away. OK, thank you. Um, I'd say stay connected however you can um, and look for ways to try to do something positive for yourself and for people around you. Thank you, Nina. I think it's me next. Um, I think I'd reiterate two things that Peggy said in her interview. I think I'd say be aware and people need people. Um, this is a, a difficult time and an opportunity really for us to connect with people, to think about others and, and to try to live our lives together in new ways regardless of the difficult circumstances. Thank you. Federica. Well, Mike stole uh, the. I, I also wanted to steal actually, like Peggy's uh, "people need people" quote, which I think is the best uh, summary of what we said. And yes, stay physically distant, uh, but find ways to to stay uh, socially and emotionally connected. Mira. Um, yes, I, I came across a campaign actually just today, and um, that's called "Ask Twice." And it's really trying to encourage that, you know, when we ask someone, how are you? We often say it as a, just a greeting, but really to ask twice to really find out how people are. So um, I think my take home message would be ask twice and don't assume, don't assume that you know, but go up to older people, ask them how they are and what they need. Thank you. And Rod. Thanks, Dina. I think, um... What I what I personally take away actually is that is the sheer diversity of experience and you can take um, I think a lot of reassurance from the different perspectives that, that allows us to have and different opinions on on and different experience that people have that it's that it's to have an insight into other people's lives can can shed light on our own and give us something to 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 inspire us. OK, thank you, everyone. I have a very quick last minute question um, and I think, Thomas, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to pass over because we're really getting to the um, the, the witching hour here um, and um, maybe we can address this for you um, offline. His question is about the issue of individual risk aversion in coping with the risk of getting infected. And I'm going to allow our uh, experts to, to get back to you on that in a reply. Um, I hope that's OK with you, because I do have a, a question that I have to address. Um, and this is about um, in our invitation, we mentioned it was possible to visit the exhibition at Toynbee Hall in London. And um, the uh, writer is saying, I understand this is no longer possible due to the second lo lockdown. Now, this seems to be a question for me, which I'm very excited about. And uh, yes, caller, you are right, unfortunately. And I guess quite ironically, we had to cancel the live exhibition, but we are hoping to host an exhibition sometime in the, new f in the near future in Toynbee Hall. And we will update the website when we know more. So until that time, please, everyone, if you'd like to visit our online exhibition on the link that we have just sent to you or find it on the Welcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities webpage or Google a combination of words like indoors, exhibition, welcome, Oxford, Toynbee Hall, I'm absolutely sure you will find it. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I. Well, this just leaves me now uh, time to say thank you to our speakers today, Adam, Peggy, Mikey, Federica, Mira, Rod, and all the people behind the scenes. That's Hannah, Graham, Millie and Anne. And so it is a huge goodbye from me and the Welcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities. And a great thank you to you for joining us today. We really hope you've enjoyed this event and will enjoy our exhibition. And Thomas, we will be getting back to you in the chat. Thank you.